Yeah, so to apply research, I'm kind of excited about that website that I discovered probably from a Facebook ad or something like that. Um, yeah, it could be on Facebook. We haven't even advertised it. Well, we've, I mean, not with ads anyway. We've we've put up stuff and and we put up posts and and we're probably more so on Twitter than than on Facebook. But yeah, that's cool that you. Was that was that where you kind of caught onto onto us? I don't remember exactly where it was. It could have been on Twitter. Um, yeah. You know, just browsing through a feed and I saw it. Yeah. And I'm I'm interested in research and I'm the president of the research club at my school. So anything that says research, I'm like, oh, what, yeah. what is this? So how why did you start that and what's the goal with the website? Oh, that's a good question. And depends if you want the short or the long answer, but I'll try to give you a brief summary. Well, it basically all came from... Uh, I've been practicing as a chiropractor now for five years, and it didn't take me very long after graduating that I kind of realized, well, I graduated uh, with an expectation of, okay, I've done five years of university, and I'm all set now, and I'm going to walk into a busy clinic, and everything's going to be like, uh, the table's going to be set for me, and then I realized there are all these things related to running a practice and be practicing as a chiropractor and as a clinician that university doesn't really prepare you for. Like we're well trained in the basic sciences and in in diagnostics and in patient management to a certain degree, but there's all this stuff around and, and you also have, there's all these other factors that you need to need to relate to in, in society that university doesn't, offer any training in, at least not where I studied. Uh, so I quickly realized, okay, there's a lot of stuff I need to, to get onto here. Uh, and my way of going about it was really uh, looking into research uh, for answers. Uh, and it didn't really take me that long until I realized, but hey, there's a lot of this stuff that, uh, you know, people charge you an arm and a leg to, to go to uh, a weekend course to learn this stuff, uh, but if you just look for it in the research, it's a lot of it is out there. So you can you can acquire a lot of that uh, knowledge and those skills by just reading the research. Uh, and that's really where it started off from. And then I met up with Jörgen Yevne, who I, I started apply research together with, uh, and he was kind of in the same in the same spot. He had a degree in physiotherapy from before, uh, so we clicked pretty much instantly and and it all just went from there and then yeah is Jürgen a PT or is he also a Cairo he's both he okay. he graduated as a physiotherapist and then he went into chiropractic school and did five years so he's now a, a chiropractor as well and you're a chiropractor and now you're currently in medical school as well is that right yeah that's correct wow okay can you give an example maybe of a, a patient encounter that made you really feel like oh my gosh I don't have all the tools that I need from school? There's something more that I need to learn? Oh, that's a good question. Um, Well, I think it's, I can't really think of a a perfect example at the moment, but I more so than, well, one aspect of it is is patient management. How am I best going to going to manage this patient? Uh, Could be, say, uh, uh, a DC patient. Uh, that I examined and, and thought, hey, this this person might be in need of some vestibular rehabilitation to aid with with their uh, condition, uh, along with manual therapy and whatever. So, and then I kind of have a at that point I had an idea about vestibular rehabilitation and what it was, but I probably wasn't that. Um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? You have to excuse my English. Been about five years since I last spent it. <laughs> That's uh, all right. Um, I probably wasn't that confident um, in that field of rehabilitation, so I would look up that and and try to find ways of managing my patients. So that's one. That was one part of it. Just uh, straight up, how am I gonna treat this patient? Then there's also the all these other stuff, other aspects of patient management that doesn't necessarily have to do with hands-on uh, therapeutic interventions or rehabilitation, but uh, communication is a, such a big part uh, of, uh, well, basically, if you're going to achieve 
anything with your patients. You need to be able to interact with them, uh, both in terms of getting uh, compliance and in terms of making them feel that they get what they wanted. Mm -hmm. A lot of it has to do with how you interact with them. It's not just what you do with them with your hands. Uh, so those are probably two of the big ones. Uh, and then also kind of how to go about speaking to medical doctors, professions uh, in the area, try to establish a, a working uh, relationship with other healthcare practitioners. Uh, I also find that reading research and knowing a little bit about their uh, field of work and how they, how they speak and communicate and what terminology they use uh, helps a lot. Yeah, I, I can totally see how that... Uh how you feel a bit limited in, in your knowledge. I mean, I'm coming to the end of school right now and in clinic, and I have experiences where I examine, I kind of diagnose, and then I know what to, how to treat initially. Yep. But then, what then? How do yep. I, over time, you know, really help this patient get back to full health yep. and get back into activity? And we've got the general knowledge of, oh, an acute thing is two weeks, but then yeah. more chronic is six weeks. But really, patients have so many questions, yeah. as well as how I interact with them verbally, and yeah. whether it's showing confidence, even if I'm not completely confident, yeah, yeah, yeah. or giving them the, um, the approval in a way to go about their lives and not have the fear of getting re-injured. Yeah. And and speaking with other professionals and being on the same page. Yep. My girlfriend is an MD, and there's as we chat, she's very supportive, but she also leads me to understand. Oh my gosh, there's some things I don't understand as much as I thought I did. Yep. You know, I thought my training and the scope of practice that we're allowed in the state gives me enough to actually treat yep. that broadly, but it there's so much I still don't know. So I, I love that you guys are trying to fill that gap. I came across uh, your ebook, your six yep. steps to kick off your clinical career. <laughs> yeah. And I read through this the other night, and yeah, it was there were so many great pieces of wisdom. Uh, how did you and Jurgen come up with this ebook? Um, that was probably one of the first things that I started working on when, once we decided, okay, we're going to make this uh, website, uh, applyresearch.com, and. Um, so, but what are we going to put on it? Uh, and I guess that ebook isn't really, as you probably noticed, it's not really, it's pretty much based on experience. So it's kind of a weird thing to introduce us the first thing you get when you, when you register for apply research. But uh, it's basically just a compilation of a lot of the experiences that I made throughout those first couple of years and, and how I kind of went about solving those issues and I guess we kind of asked ourselves okay if we could go back uh, a couple of years in time and knowing what we know now what would we have done differently and then we put that into the that was kind of the where we started from and the, then that ebook was the result yeah there are a lot of gems of wisdom in here uh, you talk about how to get ten thousand dollars worth of knowledge for free yeah i'm always battling with myself about going to seminars because there's so many great things to learn but they're incredibly expensive yeah so what's your recommendation for getting more knowledge without spending all the money well since you're asking i'd say for everyone to have a look at our webpage uh for starters but oh I would say uh, read research. That would be my number one go-to uh, advice. And basically, what people don't realize, uh, when we're students, we, we don't realize how valuable all that information that we have access to is. And you only realize once you graduate and your university cuts you off so that you can't access it anymore. And, and then you get like, on oh. PubMed and you see, click here for the full yeah, yeah, PDF, yeah. and then it says, that'll cost you $40. $40. <laughs> bucks. Um, so yeah, that would be my number one thing. Just brush up on your methodology and how to read and, and analyze research and start reading. And it's not something that comes to you immediately, but you need to work on it. And then it's, it's a skill like everything else, but you'll learn so much from it. Uh, I have anyway. That recommendation made me feel better because I have a huge collection of research articles, but 
I rarely have the time to read them. And yeah. I thought, what am I doing wasting my time downloading all of this? But then no, no, no. I read not that book. And I was like, oh, this is excellent. Yeah. When I don't have access, I've got 400 articles that Still I have got to it. read. So that'll be great. Um, and you mentioned a couple ideas of how to network and how to get your name out there. Um, let's see. In, in a couple of mistakes to avoid while you're in school and also while you are building up your practice. So if you had some maybe one or two pieces of advice for students, what would be the other key pieces of advice to give them while they're finishing Except up school? I would say if you can combine having an open mind about the stuff you come across, but at the same time maintain a critical uh, inquiring mind at the same time, then I think you're you're starting off in the in the right direction uh, from the get go. Because uh, I would say go out and expose yourself to all the stuff you can. See as many do technique courses and seminars as far as you can afford them. But just make sure that you're question everything you learn. Question everything anyone says, no matter how qualified they are. Question everything I say, um, and question your own thinking and reasoning because we're all biased uh, in in our assumptions and in our conclusions and experiences uh, and if you can if you can kind of get that concept under your skin and and uh, apply that as you go along then you'll i think you'll quickly learn what knowledge and information to keep and apply and what to to discard because there's a lot of good stuff out there uh, and but there, unfortunately there's also a lot of stuff that probably isn't as good as it should be. Now, you're practicing in Norway, but you graduated from RMIT in Sydney, Australia. Macquarie, Sydney. Oh, yeah. Macquarie, I'm sorry. Macquarie yeah. in Sydney. Um, did Macquarie offer a wide variety of uh, technique seminars and added uh, skills that you could acquire while you were in school? I'd say so. I would say we had a fair, a fair variety of, uh, of practical skills or techniques uh, in university. We had diversified techniques, Gonstead techniques, and some drop piece uh, techniques, and, and also a fair bit of rehabilitation um, in university setting. And then there was also a lot of different uh, technique courses that would be run outside of university. As well, so there's a good opportunity to be exposed to a lot of a lot of stuff. Now, coming from the um, maybe I'd say the evidence-based mindset, the research mindset that you have, but yep. also trying to be open to these technique systems, which many of them don't have a lot of you know randomized controlled trials and literature to back them up. How do you approach that to be critical, but also to be mindful and take from it what you can use? In t uh, you mean in terms of looking at a technique and, and then deciding, okay, am I going to use this or not? Yeah, and even being um, open-minded when you go in, maybe you're going into a seminar of um, you know, something that, whether it's applied kinesiology or upper yeah. cervical, uh, it, they can be fairly dogmatic. Yep. And so I struggle to go into those types of meetings or workshops and and drop that bias from the beginning yeah. and yeah. just be open minded to see what they have to say and learn from it and sometimes i'm surprised yeah that's absolutely uh, a good it's a difficult it's a difficult thing to do i think so it's, it's i say be open and be critical at the same time but it's not necessarily that easy but I think that there's kind of there are two things you need, you kind of need to distinguish between uh when looking at technique courses in my experience. And, and one thing is, okay, what are they doing? Uh, and then the other thing is, okay, why are they doing it? And I think with a lot of, that's my experience and my personal opinion, but I think a lot of techniques can help a lot of patients, but maybe not always for the reason that the technique system claims. Uh, and I don't think we, at this point, knows how all our technique works but i think there's a good bunch of literature that's starting to kind of explain to us that manual interventions 
yes, they do work, but maybe not in the in the way that we thought or have been thinking for the last 100, 50, 20, 10 years. So don't discard everything just because there aren't necessarily randomized controlled trials for it, but just have uh, be a bit cautious about the explanation that you give. That would, that's kind of how I uh, approach that question. That's great. So coming back to applied research, when when a chiropractor or a student signs up on your website, yep. what do they receive? What types of materials and information can they get? For now, uh, what you get when you register, which is free by the way, so it's not a registration as such, you just put in your email and then you're on an email list and we email you this this stuff. So the first thing you get instantly is uh, the ebook that you mentioned where we kind of put in all the all the mistakes that we did and that we would have done differently if we could go back and change it. Um, and then there's also a, a six-step uh, e-course, which is basically a bunch of articles that kind of tries and outline how you can go about um, building uh, a practice and um, a career, I guess, uh, using uh, the best knowledge from research uh, to your advantage. Uh, so basically how to, and a lot of it has to do with, I guess you can divide it into treating your patients, getting your diagnos diagnosis right, uh, interacting with the patient as well as possibly, uh, and also interacting with the, with the um, medical healthcare system that you need to operate within, and how to use research to, to do that as efficiently as possible. I guess that's the gist of it. I'm looking at the uh, the e-course right now, and the first one uh, answers the question, is there a future for me in musculoskeletal care? Which yep. I think we all are wondering, you know, where what is the future of chiropractic? Um, are we going to become more mainstream with the medical profession, or are we going to establish ourselves as subluxation specialists yep. that detect and correct subluxation? Um, and then the, let's see, I think it's the third one here talks about the hidden benefits of an evidence-based practice, seven ways that evidence-based practice will benefit you. So yep. interesting stuff. And these are, uh, pretty short reads. They're not, I mean, it's not going to take you an hour to get yep. through it. So I highly recommend people go to apply research and, uh, and sign up for it. And the ebook again for students is wonderful. Glad to hear you enjoyed it. And you graduated five years ago. You've been practicing. You're teaching yep. at university. Um, yep. What made you decide to go back to medical school? That's a good question, Nathan. Um, I'll give you the short answer. Um, one part of it was basically that I uh, we spoke briefly, or you mentioned that you have an interest in in exercise science, and and I kind of have that have that bit too. I come from sports, and so I guess there's just. I have a genuine interest in the human body and physiology and uh, there's stuff that I'm keen to learn that's kind of outside of the scope of what I would call chiropractic. Uh, so that that's probably the biggest reason why why I went back to to university. It certainly wasn't for the money because <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it takes a lot of work you know, being a full-time student and, and running a practice. Um, so that's, that's the, probably the biggest reason I, I'd say, um, just an insatiable desire to learn more. Yeah. And then there's also the other factor in it is that I don't really like to, I wish it was, I wish it wasn't like that, but I also think there's at the moment it's easier. You have more options as a medical doctor, unfortunately, in terms of at least back here, in terms of how you want to work uh, or what you want to do. And it's, say, for instance, if you don't even want to work in clinic but uh, work in other areas of healthcare or um, in society, it's easier to find those jobs with a, an MD degree than with a chiropractic degree. Although I think, I think uh, that we're going in the right direction uh, in that sense, speaking for chiropractic as well. 
What is the scope of practice like in Norway? Well, back here, we're pretty much, we're very well integrated in the public health care system, I'd say. Uh, so we're basically, chiropractors are recognized as a primary care practitioner for musculoskeletal disorders. Uh, so it's pretty much because, because we have these benefits um, as such, there's also the responsibility that we're supposed to, I guess, kind of limit our practice to musculoskeletal uh, stuff. And then we get the we have the right to to write sick leave for patients. We can refer patients directly to to imaging uh, and also refer directly to medical specialists if we have the need. And then it's also reimbursed by the not fully, but there's some reimbursement from the public health care system. I'm looking on my on exploringchiropractic.com. I have a map where I've mapped out all of the chiropractic schools throughout the world. Yeah. And I noticed there isn't currently a school in Norway. No, that's correct. Uh, that's something that's been the the kind of the the big thing that the Norwegian Chiropractic Association has been working with for the last 15 years, and they're closer than ever to achieving it. And we actually, at the moment. Um, the University of Oslo, which also has the, the medical education in Oslo, which I'm attending, they have pretty much said that we are interested in running a, a chiropractic uh, program. So it's basically all up to the politicians now to, to cough up the funding. So if that goes through, then we'll have a, then we'll have a chiropractic program integrated within the medical uh, faculty. But at the moment, no no school yet. That'll be excellent. And I'm imagining, like many of the other uh, European countries, that 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 program would be pretty closely integrated with the medical, where you would do the first few years together with medical students, yeah. and then yeah. specialize for the last few years in chiropractic. Absolutely. I don't know if you've looked into Denmark and uh, Odense yet, but they're, if it's going to happen, they're going to build it on that model. So yeah, for I think might not be completely the same, but at least over there it's three years uh, in, of medical basic science and then separated after the third year. Yeah, I love that model and you get to learn all those basic sciences together with yeah. the people that will be your peers, that you'll be referring yeah, patients exactly. back and forth. I think it's wonderful. Well, Martin, I've just got a few more questions uh, kind of about Absolutely. you to wrap things up. Um, yep. I'd like to know uh, what has been the best time for you in practice. I would have to say those patients that come in and really struggle, like they have had pains and aches for, or problems doesn't even have to be pain, but you know those. I guess those are the ones that really, really make you go home and feel like you made a difference when they've had a problem for a long time uh, and and they come to you and, and you're able to, to actually address that problem, especially if they've seen a lot of practitioners from whatever profession before. And then when you can actually make that difference that makes a real impact on their lives, that's for me the, the big thing that makes everything worth it. Sometimes those patients uh, are, surprise me and shock me in that if they get to if they get better quickly, yeah, it almost makes me feel like oh my gosh, what did I do? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because sometimes you're it's like that you're surprised how little it took. You just had to do the right things. Yeah, uh, and then all the times there's there's definitely patients where you really need to work and where you're banging your head into a wall, and but then all of a sudden you have a breakthrough after a while, and and yeah. Do you have a favorite book? or resource that you like to go to um, to learn more, to stay on top of the chiropractic profession? Ooh, that's a good one. To be honest, I haven't been reading books since I left uni. Uh, so I've pretty, uh, pretty much been just been diving into research papers. Uh, okay. but Do you have a favorite I, journal or a favorite database that you go to to pull up up? There's a few that I, that I keep track of frequently. Um, Spine. Spine Journal is one of them. Um, chiropractic and Manual Therapies is a good uh, open access. 
chiropractic oriented uh, journal uh, manual therapy it's really a physiotherapy journal but it has some really good stuff on and it's very relevant for what we do uh, as well European Spine Journal that's it's a surgical one really but there's also every once in a while there's some good stuff that we should be reading in there as well those are some good ones to to start off with uh, probably forgotten heaps but I'd say those for starters. Do you have some type of tool that helps you organize all your papers? Do you print them out and just file them away or do you have a... a no, a, I have a tool. Let's look it up. Uh, it's called Papers. Oh, I use Papers as well. Yeah, yeah. Then you know what it's like. It's pretty much it's pretty much uh, iTunes for papers, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And they've got um, the Mac, iOS. They've got a Windows yeah. version. I think they may even have just come out with Linux for any super geeks that use that yeah um very similar to mendeley which is another good one yeah. Uh, but yeah papers is mine of choice as well yeah that's where i've got yeah it. i basically signed up for that as a student and i've just stuck with it yeah wonderful um what recommendation would you give to students for choosing the school that they go to oh i would say i would i would definitely recommend doing what what you told me you've been doing to to ask around uh, speak to definitely speak to students in the different schools also speak to speak to current chiropractors or people that have graduated from the different school but just keep in mind they can quite be they can quite often be quite biased that's my experience anyway they always recommend their own schools and uh, but yeah ask around get, gather as much information as possible and then and then kind of make up your mind about why am i doing this and and then i think you'll be able to, to pick a, a good school for you from there if you were to do it all over again uh, which school do you think you would choose right now oh well if i could just go anywhere and not think about distances and and in the world I thought I had a really good education in, in Australia, to be honest. Uh, it was a good blend of, uh, of clinical skills and, and solid basic sciences um, and also research methodology. So I thought that was a really good mix. Um, so that, well, that school doesn't, that program doesn't exist anymore. But uh, to be honest, I kind of hesitate to answer that question just because I don't really know that much about the the programs over in in the states, for mm -hmm. instance, um, or in Canada. I've heard there's some great ones in Canada. Uh, the, I'm sure there is in the states as well. But um, if I was to go in Europe, I would have probably gone to Denmark just because. Mm. But I might be biased because I'm doing medicine now. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> Do you think you might have, uh, if you started all over, would you have done medicine first? without going the chiropractic route? I've thought about that. Uh, and, you know, the answer is no. I, when, I, when I first started doing chiropractic, doing medicine did, hadn't even crossed my mind. Uh, and I also think that knowing what I know now and uh, having the experience that I've had from chiropractic school and from practicing as a chiropractor for five years, uh, if there's one thing I'm certain of, it's that that is going to make me that much of a better clinician and medical doctor eventually mm -hmm. than if I just gone straight into medical school. So I, I wouldn't have been without that experience ever. Do you find that there's a big difference uh, between your experience in chiropractic and now medical school with the, the challenge, the difficulty level of the courses, the amount of information you have to learn? No, not really. That's a pretty quick no. Uh, I'd say the amount of work is about the same. I'm a little bit biased now because I have I have all this stuff from chiropractic, which I'm now pretty much doing again in medicine, or a lot of it overlaps. So I guess that kind of make, probably makes the program now easier for me than it would have been initially. But I would say the amount of work is about the same. The basic sciences are the same. Uh, so I would say chiropractic students doesn't have anything to, to be ashamed of compared to a medical student in terms of workload. Well, what is your vision, your hope for chiropractic in the next 10 years? Ooh, I would like to see chiropractic 
being a little bit less certain about the stuff that is so uncertain. Hmm. And I think that would make it a lot easier to... For me, it's kind of a big thing to to get accepted by not just the medical profession, but, but society and the healthcare system that you're working within. We, I cannot see the, the profession surviving and flourishing without uh, somehow fitting into the society uh, that we're in. And to do that, I th- also think you need to be a part of the, of the, of the healthcare system. Uh, and to do that, I think we need to be able to communicate what we're doing and why we're doing it um, to other professions as well and to, and to governments and politicians. And so if anything, I would like to see chiropractic uh, be able to communicate better with the rest of the society, I'd say. Wonderful. Well, Martin, thanks for sharing uh, about Apply Research and your experience as a chiropractor in Norway. Where can students learn more and follow you online. If you want to follow us and read more about the stuff that we've been talking about today, Nathan, you can go to applyresearch.com and just have a look around there and you'll just take it from there. Do you guys have a presence on Facebook and Twitter as well? Absolutely. We're on Twitter and we're on Facebook. If you just search for Apply Research, you'll, we should pop up.